Madiha, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I am so incredibly honored. It is such a joy as usual. Well, great to have you back. Congratulations on the book. I I'm going to start with an opening paragraph in your book, which I, I found to be pretty startling. So here we go. Quote, according to the Centers for Disease Control, approximately 60% of all adults in the United States have at least one non-communicable chronic health condition, while 40% have two or more. And the numbers continue to grow at an alarming rate. Worldwide obesity has nearly tripled since 1975 and obesity affects one in every three adults. Almost 2 billion adults are overweight and one in five children are obese. One out of every two children has a chronic health condition. And this statistic is estimated to increase to eight out of every 10 by 2025. Crazy. Chronic disease is on the rise as six in every 10 adults have a chronic health condition and four in every 10 have two or more chronic health conditions. These numbers are growing at an alarming rate, affecting about 133 million Americans. It is projected that in 10 years, 83 million Americans will have three or more chronic conditions as compared to 30 million in 2015. And I'll, I'll stop there. there there's a lot more data you have in the book and I, I could spend the next couple hours just going through it, but I'm going to stop there and pause. There's a lot to be concerned about. I, I don't want to spend too much time on this because we're optimistic. Um, yes, hope. but that's a hope. It, yeah, it, it, what do you think is driving these horrific numbers for both adults and children? You know, and I think that's the million dollar question and this is why I love functional integrative holistic medicine, because us as conventional medicine doctors, we're just sort of, you know, we just address, here's a problem. And then we bandaid it with these quick approaches and then get you out the door and we'll never really get into the understanding of why. So why are we getting sicker as a humanity? Why are we making wrong decisions? Why are we just suffering overall? And so understanding that why, and that's where the hope lies, right? And so if we can understand what is the root of all this suffering, we can help put our bodies back into balance and including specifically our future back into balance. And it's not just, you know, internally, externally, it's all of this looking at it holistically. But today, our children's lifestyles are completely out of balance. Our lifestyles are completely out of balance. And I think that despite, you know, all of the unhealthy diets, the warnings against it, we're still eating unhealthy diets. Fast food is more now than ever before with increased artificial junk food consumption, limited diet variety, lack of sleep, the lack of nature, the lack of exercise, fun, play, increased stress, negative social environments, increased exposures to toxins inside and outside the home, that all of this, I think, contributes to an imbalanced us, an imbalanced world. And this then leads to one of the tr like drivers of chronic illness, and that's inflammation. And inflammation is seriously disconnecting us from our one, we're not making decisions properly, right? And now science has actually proven that inflammation is disconnecting our children's and our prefrontal cortex and our amygdala. And that, those, that's really key to decision making, which is an entire science called neuroeconomics, and where, where it's our prefrontal cortex and our amygdala. But because we're living in this imbalanced lifestyle now, we are not able to use our whole brain to make logical decisions. So we're making, even though we know all these things are not great for us, but this inflammation is really cutting off the, the connection between our prefrontal cortex and our amygdala. And thereby we're not making thought out decisions. And it's really decreasing empathy, poor relationships, more anger, fostering that everyone hates me mentality. So. Really, I think the inflammation, this fire inside, this chronic inflammation is really driving a lot of these chronic health conditions. And it's really destroying our future, unfortunately. 
And it's not just the inflammation in our food. No. Nope. It's the, the inflammation in our thoughts. It's in the inflammation of what we read in the news cycle. It, it's, I think inflammation, yes, there's a scientific definition of what that is, but mm -hmm. I also think of inflammation in a larger sense of what's happening culturally. Culturally, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's, that is allowing our, that's disconnecting our prefrontal cortex and our amygdala. And we're just not making the right, you know, decisions are basically chronic inflammation in all aspects of our lives is hijacking our brains, period. And I mean, specifically when it comes to children and our behaviors, right? And there was just a recent amazing study in Harvard and Columbia where they looked at a group of 4,000 children. And these researchers determined that those children, at, when they checked their blood markers, those children with, you know, behavioral and emotional functioning problems at the age of eight, when they check their blood at the age of 10, they actually had higher levels of two proteins called C-reactive protein and interleukin-6. And those are pro-inflammatory pro cytokines that's produced when in response to tissue injury or infections. And so studies are now showing that we can start seeing this inflammation. So this, these inflammatory cytokines can be present in children and these just behavioral issues and from very young. And these, this can then can translate to children with inflammation, again, in adulthood. So I think just like what you're saying, you're right. It's all an in inflammation in all these aspects in our lives that's even trickling down to our children. And because we are now living in a world that where our children are being raised in a world with inflammation <laughs> in all different aspects, that then is then, you know, reciprocating down to an adulthood. And we are now we are becoming more inflamed adults, Discon again, disconnecting our prefrontal cortex. We're living imbalanced lives. We're, we're unable to make logical decisions and it's really threatening our future. So give us some hope. H how do we turn this around? I think our audience is a pretty healthy bunch, but I, I think we all want to do better. We all want to help those who need help. How do we turn this around? We need help, right? Lots of hope. And for me specifically, I think, I mean, and it really, I think starts with gratitude and it's that perception It's because our perception can either be our pain, our perception can be our power. So we have to put hope back into this gratitude in this way for me. I mean, we can either live in a world where everything is negative and we're fear based and oh my gosh, what's going to happen? Or, oh my God, there's so much that can happen. So let's do that. Specifically, I love, so starting off with gratitude, every single solitary morning is really where I start off with my patients and my families, because that fear that drives us really disconnects our prefrontal cortex and our amygdala. And therefore we think more with our amygdalas in this fear based society. And then we make fight and flight type of decision making. So really starting off with gratitude, I think is really important. Then going to, you know, our bodies and our brains, and our children's bodies, our brains are all made from food. So right now, currently we're eating the wrong foods, not enough of the right foods and overeating foods. So if we can, you know, and our children, our bodies, specifically our adolescents are in a critical phase of neurodevelopment with lots of hormones and structures and behavioral and molecular connections. So specifically, these adolescents are vulnerable to these stresses that can all lead to behavioral uh, changes, specifically in our foods. And junk food, junk food literally changes and impairs our adolescents' brains to think, learn, remember, it, it lower their overall memory, and even control like the impulses. Because these kids actually, they done in the Lancet actually, it was it came out where they looked at over a hundred studies. And saw that the, are these kids, these adolescents' brains are not formed fully. And they have higher, they actually have more dopamine receptors. And so the adolescent brain is much more influenced by their environment. So now it's research actually just today, like actually, no, two days ago, I like two days ago, the new research actually found that just children who ate, children 
that when we ate more fruits and vegetables had better mental health. I mean, that's stuff that we already know of, right? But this research actually studied 9,000 children, 9,000 children in 50 schools. And so I think just like it really is benefits our children and also benefits us with the foods that we're eating. I mean, there was another, and this is just another really fun study where all these, it's so powerful that the things that we can put in our bodies, in our mouths, have a dramatic effect in our, beha- in our behaviors and specifically our children's behaviors. And where they actually, there is another study in a couple months ago in 2020, just this year, 2021, where they have followed more than like 400 infants and boys with a gut bacterial composition when it was higher of something called bacteroides at the age of one year. That bacteroides actually produces a metabolite that is called spingolipids that is instrumental for the formation and the structure of neurons in the brain. So those children that dealt with that have were breastfed, ate a high fiber diet, living with the animal or a dog, exposed to nature, green spaces, specifically, you know, were there, they had more of this bacteroides, which then equated to bad, more advanced cognition and language skills in one, one year later. So these are the simple things that we can do by just eating a whole foods, plant-based diet, tons of vegetables, clean protein, healthy fats, eating the rainbow, lots of fiber. You can actually determine what kind of gut bacteria are in your children's gut to help them really optimize their brain function. Because an imbalanced gut microbiome then leads to obviously increased immune cells that leads, you know, release cytokines that talk to other immune cells, that, that those messages cross the blood brain barrier to activate the brain's immune system. So either way, it's so important to start with diet. And specifically, I think another thing that I really wanted to throw out there was um, our children now, our children and we, us also, are more overweight and obese than ever before. There was actually a study also done where they took 2,519 children ages from 8 to 16 and found that the these children that were actually overweight and obese had psychosocial and cognitive consequences on their academic performance. So inflammation associated with obesity and insulin resistance actually worsened executive function in both adolescents and adults. So again, it's not just important, I think, how much like we're yet eat tons of vegetables, clean protein, healthy fats. Then we're intermittent fasting to really lower that insulin resistance and then manage, obviously, leptin resistance that we can talk about. But what it's really super important is to get those nutrients, tons of vegetables, clean protein, healthy fats, eating the rainbow. To really, that's where I really like to start off. And then obviously, you know, because obviously nutrients are, you know, regulate every single chemical reaction in our bodies. So it's really good to start there. You mentioned leptin resistance. Can you explain to us what it is and why it's something we need to think about as adults and also for children as well? So, you know, leptin is a hormone for of hunger that's produced by the fat cells that inform you when one is satiated so that one can stop eating. <laughs> so it is a gatekeeper of fat metabolism, and that's really monitors how much energy an organism takes in. So when the stomach starts to fill up, the fat cells release leptin to tell the brain to stop eating. And when the body is constantly overloaded, like what we're doing nowadays, I think all day long, all night long, snacking, it can then overwhelm the system and that can then lead to these constant surges of leptin. And so like insulin, over time, the body's receptors start to turn off and there'd be one when the body can become resistant to leptin, which basically means that the body starts stops listening to the leptin signals. Just with all of their hormonal issues, leptin, leptin resistance is actually a really complex problem, but overweight, overeating, gaining weight, obesity can all make sure that can all actually increase to, to lead to too much insulin and the body, it's like, it's little, it gets a little bit uncomfortable for the body. 
And specifically the consequences, again, we're seeing this more and more because not even just us to uh, our, us adults, but it's also affecting our children now where it's this growing power problem is actually leading to inflammation, which again, we talked about. And, uh, and now they've shown that this inflammation is actually the amygdala was a lot more active in those children who were more with insulin and leptin resistance. And we're more likely to develop um, type 2 diabetes. So it's, again, something that's really important to watch out for. Because I think right now we're eating too much processed foods and too many artificial foods that's raising our blood sugar level, that's raising our, that's, uh, raising our leptin levels and our body start to become numb to this. And it can really cause problems even in our brain functioning specifically cognitive processing involving learning. As we think about leptin resistance, if we think we're seeing that personally or with a family member or a friend, what, what are some of the foods we should focus on to help combat that? So again, uh, it's a, a whole foods, plant-based diet, lots of vegetables, clean protein, healthy fats. And I really think the healthy fats, because those specifically, because when you when those healthy fats are really what's going to go and say, oh, no, we've had enough food now, leptin, it turns to leptin on, we're all good. But, I mean, when we go, it's those processed carbs that really turn off, that, that really lead to leptin resistance. I mean, when we go to a restaurant, right, what is the first thing that they give us? <laughs> bread. And that's what we think, oh, wow, look, we're going to fill up on this bread and this processed carbs. So, but what, what happens? is that we're like eating and eating. Oh, we're going to get this bread, this butter. Oh yeah, delicious. But then that goes, and actually they're smart because that goes and inhibits the leptin that then we don't know when we're satiated. So we just keep on eating and eating and eating. So I think really start focusing on like lowering those processed junk foods in the body and then leading to let them improving healthy fats in the diet. Sometimes when you're introducing uh, a healthy food, <laughs> Whether we're adult or a kid, <laughs> your palate needs to get adjusted. If you Absolutely. haven't been, you know, if you've been eating McDonald's all the time and, and then you segue to broccoli and spinach and wild salmon, it's going to it's going to be a little bit of a shock to the system to say the mm -hmm. least. And something you, you focus on in the book, which I love are herbs and spices. What are some of the herbs and spices that, that you think are really great that we should be introducing and, and probably all have in our cupboard for that food that maybe doesn't taste so great? But so we need to add something to it to make it a little bit more appealing. Well, I love my herbs and spices, right? One of the most powerful things to lower and lower inflammation and fight inflammation, optimize your immune system. And specifically, I know we all use like the green herbs like oregano and anti, you know, which are, which is antifungal, antibacterial, antiparasitic, all these, but I'm going to be a little biased. I love I love my Indian spi Indian Pakistani spices with all like the turmeric, again, really powerful anti-inflammatory, optimizes detoxification, black pepper, which really helps with nutrient absorption, hot chili, cayenne increases circulation, lowers the inflammation and boosts metabolism. So really, and then cumin, again, anti-cancer, and it helps with the immune system. So again, just all of these and cinnamon, oh, who doesn't love cinnamon? Right, especially right now, September. <laughs> and then um, in the fall season, the cinnamon stabilizes the blood sugar and then your blood pressure. So again, all of these are really important to incorporate. And that for me, that's I'd love to do this with the kids also. They're like, okay, like what, what kind of spices are we going to check today? What are we going to add to this? And then it's really, I think with those spices, you could truly experiment in the kitchen. And that's when it becomes where you're truly boosting up the nutritional value of these foods. And again, it really helping the brain of a child's brain and body. And it, it's a lot of fun to really experiment with the kids in the kitchen with different types of spices. And then look, let's add this and let's see how it helps the food taste up. So it becomes like an experiment, like a research project. And it. it's so much fun. So you mentioned our immune system earlier, and I think that's top of mind for many. What, what are some of your favorite immune boosting foods and vitamins and minerals as well. So seriously, right? Because right now, a lot of us are dealing with wanting to put exactly what's in our bodies that are going to optimize our immune systems and support it. 
And so specifically, supplements and nutrients can optimize the immune system. It can actually prevent and treat the upper respiratory tract infections. And nutrients, actually, what's really cool is that these nutrients have a synergistic role in every state of the immune system. And it's really complex integrated, integrated into the immune system because the immune system needs specific nutrients like micronutrients like uh, vitamin D, vitamin C, A, E, B vitamins, including B6, B12, folate, zinc, iron, copper, magnesium, even selenium. So deficiencies, I mean, we are, we're deficient in all of these uh, micronutrients, unfortunately, specifically even vitamin A. But I love the, like the foods that the three foods that come to mind specifically when it comes to immune boosting that again, I love to incorporate into my daily routine and meals are like brown foods, like mushrooms, right? White, white button mushrooms are really great sources of bioactives, including beta glucans, which is an immune stimulating dietary fiber. And then obviously different types of mushrooms like reishi and shiitake and mataki and all these that can actually strengthen the immune system by improving natural killer cells. Broccoli sprouts, I know I talked about this last time. <laughs> I love broccoli sprouts. Love to put it in everything. They contain sulforaphane, again, a really potent bioactive that activates the immune system. And then sprouts obviously contain 100, 100 more sulforaphane than the regular broccoli, which again increases NK cell activity and also boosts the immune defenses against the flu virus. And then chili peppers, chili, I love it. Adding chili to all my uh, foods, a lot of my foods. Uh, again, it has the capsaicin in it, which activates the immune system and has been shown to increase the number of uh, circulating white blood cells and antibody producing B cells. So again, there's, I mean, there's immune calming foods like to calm the immune system down if it's overall and that's that or, you know, we have acerola is these are the new things that I started putting in like all my smoothies, acerolas, and then obviously broccoli sprouts and broccoli and camel camel and uh, cherry tomatoes, grapefruit. We have green tea and then there's those strawberries, oranges, and then there's immune boosting foods. And those really include like garlic and black raspberries and blackberries and blueberries and broccoli sprouts and different types of mushrooms, chestnuts, chili, peppers, grapes. So just really eating and the rainbow can really optimize our immune system with both you know, top immune calming foods, immune boosting foods. I love it. And, and there's a couple I want to call out specifically. So I'll start with iron. Iron is, you know, critical for kids, critical for adults. It's something just on a personal level I notice. So I don't eat as much red meat as I used to. And at one time when I did, when I ate a lot of red meat, my iron was actually high. It was like 200, not good. And no. then it like went to like 150 and now it's like in the mid fifties. So mm -hmm. like what I noticed it dropped. So it dropped about a hundred points for six months. And I was like, huh, what's in my red, red blood cell, white blood cell, blood, blood, everything's good. So like, but it's like, huh, what have I done to do this? And so you talk about diet. I'm like, okay. I've actually, if I look at my sources of iron, I'm eating, I, I probably cut my consumption of beans in half mm -hmm. over the six months. I'm not really eating shellfish. I'm not really eating red meat. I'm not having spinach. I have some broccoli, but not a lot of broccoli. And then what I'm also doing is my strength training has been more intense. And so. I was, and I'm just doing some reading. I want your take on this. Mm -hmm. I was like, huh, okay. This is like, okay, dropped a hundred points. All the blood cells look good. So I'm not mm -hmm. concerned about something bigger going on. But I'm like, huh, diet. I probably cut my iron intake in half at least. And I've increased my strength training. And one, one thing I know about strength training and iron is it actually like it, it, it eats it up. I'm, I'm Absolutely. Not a, something like that. So I was like, huh. I bet you, and I think a lot of our audience like leans a little bit more plant-based. I think we have, we have a lot of meat eaters, but so powerful. And so can we just talk about that for a moment? Cause I'm like, huh, I'm the one who does like ridiculous lab work with Dr. Frank Lippman uh, and his it. team. So I get like this 25 page report, yeah. you know, a couple of times a year and I see everything and that's what can be good or bad. But I was like, huh, 
I'm pretty knowledgeable and I didn't really think about this. So can we just pause there and talk about our, like focus on that for a second? I'm Absolutely. curious to your thoughts about that. Absolutely. And I think, um, I think from the very beginning, we've been worried about iron. I mean, I, is your kids getting enough iron? Are your families getting enough iron, right? What is iron? Iron's a trace mineral that's really found in every living cell of the body, right? And it's primarily component of two proteins, hemoglobin and myoglobin. But according to this, even CDC, iron deficiency is most common. One is the most common form of nutritional deficiencies. So it is important to talk about this because again, iron is important for preventing anemia. It supports your energy levels. It helps your cognitive function and supports development and growth overall. It's needed for healthy children's brains and bodies and then even healthy pregnancies. It supports the immune system, just like we talked about, and even positive mood and prevents restless leg syndrome. So I think a lot of it, we think that it can only come from these. Yes, there's liver, which is really great and iron sources and then meats and fish and beans. But I know there's a lot of great resources, even for example, like one of my favorite sources of iron is spirulina, right? So spirulina has like one ounce. So you don't even need that much has eight milligrams of iron, which is awesome. Where liver, three ounces of organic beef liver has about 4.05 milligrams. So these plant-based foods can actually have a lot of iron in them. Lentils, dark chocolate even, 3.3 in one ounce, you can get 3.3 milligrams of iron. So again, it's really important to get it from these. And then you can really optimize your overall health. And specifically with kids now, they've shown, they've actually shown scientifically that just this, uh, that childhood, just by giving children and making sure that they're getting their nutrients from plant-based sources, where for uh, childhood iron, but that really does play a role in their mental and motor and general behavior because they've actually shown that those deficiencies can actually lead to impairment in both motor and cognitive functions in children's brains. And so to making sure that for me, every morning we change up our smoothies. My kids love smoothie bowls, <laughs> right? And I'll add in actually in my smoothie bowls, we talked, we just talked about spices or immune system things and bring it all together. But these smoothie bowls are now my kids new favorite things to have for breakfast and to change it up with different types of fruits and vegetables and herbs and spices and different types of iron rich food, different, like all these amazing, even spirulina goes in <laughs> turmeric, you know, root turmeric root. But all of this is really then important and enough. Another fun way that you can get, you make sure your kids get those nutrients in through like, and then I'll top it with like pumpkin seeds, which again is really high. It also pumpkin is, seeds are great. Yes. Pumpkin seeds are great. So that's why we'll do less like a acai, acai bowl with all of these fruits and vegetables and change them up all the time. Top them with like pumpkin seeds, some uh, those goji, goji berries, and then some grain free granola. Oh, delicious. And now you're getting all the, another great way to get in iron sources. Yeah, it's really important. And once I saw that, I said to myself, I bet there are a lot of other people who aren't anemic. I'm not anemic. The no. blood cell count is good. I think a lot of people are probably on the low side if they lean plant-based because you have to really integrate those food. Like if you have beans once a week, that's not going to do it. No, or, to integrate it. Absolutely. And so you really have to, that's my learning for those who lean vegetarian or plant-based and who work out. And then I, and then I was like, huh, and I'm exacerbating this by strength training because strength training actually depletes mm -hmm. iron I think more, I think faster if I, I have that right. So at any rate, it was interesting. That's one takeaway I have for everyone. So on the subject of minerals and our immune system, ha we have to touch on vitamin D. I feel like vitamin D is in the news all the time. Can you talk about vitamin D and, and why it's so critical and how we should think about that for kids and adults alike? Absolutely. You know, over the last 12 years of practicing medicine and checking vitamin D in the thousands of patients, we are deficient. <laughs> But it's sad because we were never really taught this in residency, medical school, very little, limited. Uh, and no, we never know we ever checked it, right? But, you know, vitamin D is an interesting vitamin or a pro-hormone that is essential for as a precursor for hundreds of disease 
preventing proteins and enzymes. And it really binds to many receptors, causing changes to the cell function. So we actually make vitamin D3 as a sunlight hits our skin. And then what happens is the liver and the kidneys transform vitamin D into a more active form, allowing our cells to read DNA instructions more effectively. So again, it's really important for our genetic code. Vitamin D also regulates, it. it's a vital component for hormones and neurotransmitters like, you know, serotonin. It also helps to control cell growth. It's a cancer fighter. It's essential in mineral metabolism. It's also really great for bone. It's a major player in bone strength and regulates absorption and transfer of calcium and magnesium and phosphorus for bone mineralization and then growth. So overall, we need this. It's right. Vitamin disease preventer. It's vital for incre decreasing inflammation, improving, optimizing our immune system and lowering insulin resistance. But what the sad reality is that seven out of 10 United States children are low in vitamin D. And that's too after studying like 6,000 children. And these deficiencies are actually specifically in our children are, um, can really lead to problems, even starting prenatally. So a study actually showed that these mothers with vitamin D levels during pregnancies was actually directly associated with the child's IQ and suggested that higher vitamin D levels in pregnancies may actually lead to greater I childhood IQ scores. So yay for me, like that's, it. that's one thing that we could even just give our moms and our, and our pregnant women and our, and our kids is vitamin D to really optimize again their brain function. They've even shown that the risk of vitamin of ADHD was 34% higher in children whose mothers had vitamin D deficiency and uh, during pregnancy. And so again, incorporating vitamin D can actually result in less aggressive behavior, less anxious children and adolescents and less depressive moods. So for me, I'm like hiding because <laughs> I don't want to deal with aggressive children or families. But again, it's really beneficial for all of our moods and our immune systems and our brain development and bone health, like we talked. So really making sure that you're getting enough vitamin D, either if it's from cod liver oil, which again provides the, or provides DHA, vitamin A, and then the D3, and, and then a little lesser amounts, uh, vitamin K and vitamin E, but making sure that we're taking some sort of vitamin D and then obviously incorporating those vitamin D rich foods like your sea vegetables, you know, your fish, you know, mushrooms like portobellos, the eggs, egg yolk, like the cod liver, oil, and all of those delicious foods. And so one thing I'll just call out with D also. So if, yeah. if you go to a, go to your doctor and you get a lab, I think the acceptable range for healthy, I think is like 30 to a hundred, but, but in the reality, you don't want that. Like, no. so let's just talk about that for you a moment. Like what, what's the number? Cause I think this is important that cause it, cause, and this is the, the problem with lab work. Sometimes they have the acceptable levels, if you will. And sometimes those levels are accurate and sometimes mm -hmm. not accurate, but sometimes they're not optimal. And so let's just, and without going, there's so many, this could be a, in a 10 hour podcast, but Absolutely. just for, for D specifically, just D specifically, like what's that level that people want to shoot for when they get their lab work? So for me, I have them go through anywhere from like 50 to 70 is 70 to 80, even yeah. uh, de and depending on what they're dealing with. That's really a nice sweet spot. And yep. then, and even for kids, even if they wanted to take it, what I like to do for once a child's levels optimize, continuing like a dosage of like 20 times their weight in pounds daily, or like 2000 to 4,000 international units per day. So that's for kids. So again, you want to always make sure that you want to keep your levels between around, you know, 50 to even 80. That's like a sweet spot. I mean, higher if you're especially dealing with, you know, a chronic health condition. But so for kids and adults, making sure that we're eating and then also taking the supplementation needed to keep us there. So the book is filled with, with so much data, a lot of great research. We love that. And, and you've also, you mentioned before the show that just it, it keeps on coming. I'm curious. I like, love yeah. Like what, what's been the most surprising in terms of data research, whether it's in the book or it's something you've just come across where you've just kind of said, wow, that, that's, that's interesting. So I think um, with all of this, specifically when it comes to the gut microbiome, 
and uh, you know how these bugs can actually influence our children's brain developments in specific which ones actually affect it and which ones don't another i think that i think just with their, our everyday lifestyles and how much our everyday lifestyles for example that there was there was another amazing study done with the with just technology and how technology right now it really is affecting our children's brains and their bodies and i think that research is all this research is really affecting how this how children are actually having like physical responses to too much screen time and not even just i think too much screen time to even how us as adults are interacting in their world and that's what's really powerful and that, that it's so amazing how it, we think that our emotions us us as parents or as adults our emotions and our stress is hiding them from children and families that are not really going to make a big difference but actually the studies have shown that it our kids are actually really responding to even the things that we are even hiding i mean one thing that really i loved is i mean we've been sort of studying mirror neurons for a long time so since the 1990s we've been actually research, so researching mirror neurons but mirror neurons are actually they show the activity when one observes an act being done and when they actually perform the act themselves and it plays a large role in like speech and language and evolution and emotional intelligence and empathy and even learning and understanding. So positive company or the stresses that your parents are facing or the things that you're dealing with, that positive company can actually increase the child's sense of purpose and belonging and boost happiness and reduces their stresses and their immune system. But now that they're, sh they're showing that you don't have to be doing the thing that yourself, that somebody else can be doing it and you can be getting that same reciprocating that those same kind of effects in your own body just by the, you know, by these mirror neurons, because they may be like loving and hugging or they may be dealing with the stress, but now your, your, your brain or child's is actually reciprocating all of that. I mean, which is so powerful, right? And they're actually... That whatever is happening in your life through these different hormones and um, chemicals and mirror neurons, that children are seeing the effect in their bodies. And I feel like that's just so powerful that we think that, oh, they're just kids. They're not going to really notice it or their families or even just people around you, right? How they're not going to, oh, they're not going to notice it. But we can actually start to how we live our lives affects uh, it can really affect not just us but the biology of <laughs> those people that live around us and that for me was just so powerful in closing what's one thing that anyone listening should focus on that will have a meaningful impact in their overall health and well-being one thing and i'm gonna say it again <laughs> I think I know the answer. I think I, I know the it answer. Because it's so powerful. Because seriously, if there's one thing you're going to do today is to make the best decision to roll up off the bed on the right side of the bed. And I do. I really love the power of positivity. Because gratitude and optimism strengthen the connection between the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex. And it's something that you can start today. Like just say 10 things that you're thankful for every day. That the just incorporating these words of gratitude and appreciation, and we can actually help to create purpose in our day-to-day -day routine. We can create a balanced life and be balanced humanity. And so just by starting off with gratitude, every single Saturday day, we can change our perspective in life. Every single day. It's so much fun. So much <laughs> help. <laughs> Medea, thank you so much. My pleasure.